What's up, future respiratory therapists? In this video, I'm going to walk you through and talk you through the intubation process. This is part two. Let's dive in. All right, so as I stated, I'm going to be intubating this person uh, for you here, this mannequin here today. And uh, I'm just going to walk you through some key elements of it. I know a lot of you are probably preparing for maybe competencies for the intubation process. And uh, I'm going to give you some key points that that oftentimes led to failure during the intubation process when you're learning it in the lab environment. Now, the first thing you have to do when you're going to intubate a patient is to gather all of your appropriate supplies. So we know that we have everything here we need for that. We have our Ambu bag. Now, don't forget that you also need your mask. So if we need to bag valve mask to ventilate this patient, which we most likely will prior to the first attempt, we're going to need a mask and a bag. Now, the big error that sometimes is made is, is when we start intubating, we take this off and we throw it to the side. And, and, and now it's not on our body or within our reach so that if we fail, we're probably going to need this again. So point number one. Don't ever get rid of your mask. Always keep it within his arm's reach of you. Don't lose it in the bed. Know where it's at. So when you need it, you have it. And you're now not looking like, I need a new mask. That's going to be a bad situation you don't want to be in. Okay. So Ambu bag and mask. We talked about our laryngoscope and our blade in the last video. I'm using a number two Macintosh, my light is working, so I have a, a functional laryngoscope and blade here ready to go. I'm also going to have my endotracheal tube uh, of choice. So uh, I'm using a 7.0 today, maybe a little small for a male, but nonetheless, this is the tube I have, so this is the tube I'm using. Now, I also always, before we start this process, I want to check my cuff. To check the integrity of my cuff, I'm also going to need at least a 10 ml syringe. This is a 20 because it's all I have, but a 10 ml will work is work fine as well. So before we ever even do this, I'm going to inflate the cuff. And while it's still in the package, I'm just going to give a little squeeze and it should hold air. If it deflates with just a little bit of pressure, it's a bad cuff and you don't want to use that too to, to uh, intubate your patient with. So after I check the cuff, I'm going to let this back down. So we're gonna we're gonna deflate the cuff all the way back down and uh, get ready to to start back over here. Okay. So my syringe again stays in my hand. Some people leave it connected to the pilot balloon. Uh, it's fine either way. Uh, just have it on your body so that you know where it's at when it's time to inflate that cuff. Now to insert the endotracheal tube when performing an oral intubation. This is not a nasal intubation. This is an oral intubation. I realize that this tube is very bendy. Well, I want it to be rigid. That's why I'm going to utilize a stylet. The stylet is going to increase the rigidity of the endotracheal tube so that I can control the tip of it with the proximal end here. Okay, now, key point here. Anytime you use a stylet, you don't want the tip of the stylet to protrude out past the tip of the endotracheal tube. You don't even want it that far. You see that, that hole right there? That's called a Murphy's eye. You want your stylet to be proximal to the Murphy's eye. So you can see here, that is too far. We want it back just before the Murphy's eye and we want it to stay right there. I can put a slight bend in my stylet and now it can't advance anymore. And I have my endotracheal tube and style it ready for intubation. Now, some people would curve these slightly different ways. That's kind of all preference based. Uh, the other thing is, is that you would likely be manipulating this endotracheal tube while it was still in the package so that this all stays clean uh, so that we don't we don't have our dirty hands and the underneath the pillow and all the 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 the, the bugs that are that are that are floating around you know, we don't want this to be dirty when we put it into our patient, because if it is, it's going to be associated with a high risk of ventilator associated pneumonia. So we want to keep this as clean and as sterile as possible 
prior to the intubation phase. Okay, so keep it in the package as long as possible. Now, I have everything I need to intubate this patient, including my entitled CO2 detector. Now, we all know this is a bacteria filter, but we're just playing the game today because I actually don't own one of these. I know that seems weird. I have a mannequin, but I don't have an entitled CO2 detector. I don't. Uh, so we're just going to utilize this. So just for today, pretend that this is your colorimetry device that is going to change colors in the presence of detected CO2. So we'll be utilizing this here shortly. Now, we've bagged my patient and we are ready to begin the process of intubation. Now remember, I'm using my Macintosh. Now remember, the Macintosh goes into the vollecula and indirectly displaces the epiglottis so that I can see the glottic opening. I should be able to see the vocal cords for me to insert in the tracheal tube through. Now, I'm gonna turn the table this way because I want you to see here how this is gonna work. <clears throat> As I go to insert this, into my patient's mouth, I'm going to start on the right side of their mouth and I'm going to sweep towards the middle. Now at this point in time, I am visualizing the oral cavity. I see the base of the tongue and I see my patient's epiglottis. From the side, it looks like this. I can see. Now the key thing here is I'm not cranking back like this. I'm going to go in until I've been positioned and then I'm raising upright this way. So you can see the action is up and towards the corner of the room, not back, because this will tear up your patient's teeth. And that's not what we're here for, right? So let's be kind and, and try to value that process of this procedure. So I see the epiglottis. I see my vocal cords. I see my glottic opening. And I am now going to insert my endotracheal tube. We're going to go in. Follow it down. I can see the tip of my tube. I saw it go through the vocal cords. Now I'm going to come out with my blade. I'm going to break that down so my light doesn't get ruined. And then I'm going to pull this out. I am going to inflate my cuff. And then I'm going to validate that I have good breath sounds. Now, something you may have noticed is that since I have inserted this into tracheal tube into this patient here, I have not taken my left hand off of this tube. And that's important because if this person was to be uh, either slightly aroused or start to, 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 to kind, of, kind of fight or, or resist the process here, they start shaking their head. If you let go, this can now come out and about and out. And we don't want that to happen, right? We want this to stay in the patient. So once I get it in, I am going to keep it very, very secured with my hand at all times, never, ever, ever letting go of it. Let me get this patient reintubated. I want to show you one more little trick here. Something I tend to notice a lot when I see students learning how to do this procedure is they, they want to start like this. So I've got my tube in my right hand. I've got my uh, blade in my left hand. I'm going to start out here. What I find here is that I'm trying to find that glottic opening, right? And I can see it there, but you see where my arm is in line with my shoulder? It's all very compact. That means I'm transferring energy to my hand that is allowing me to create the motion I need to see the, voc the glottic opening. A lot of times I see people doing it like this, and it's, it's like, how? And it's like, this is so hard. I don't know how long I can hold this. And you're right, you can't because your power is starting here in your shoulder, but it's having a transfer out in a way. So you can really leverage your, 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 your mechanics, your body mechanics by having everything in line. And then it all lines up nice and straight. And it's just much more efficient use of, of energy. So now, okay, I'm back in now. Okay, so I'm out. I've got my tube secured. I'm going to hold here with my left hand. So notice I've got it secured here, not just holding it up here like this, because if the patient's head starts to shake back and forth, I can lose it like this also. So I'm going to secure my hand to their chin and then hold like this. Now, wherever their head goes, I go with it. Stylet comes out. I need to inflate this cuff. So you kind of have to be, you know, have some, some deck, some, um, 
manual dexterity here to do two things at once. I'm still holding the tube, but I'm also holding uh, my pilot balloon also to inflate. Now, what I need to do is validate that I am in the airway. So here comes my entitled CO2. Remember, makeshift. I know that's a bacteria filter. Makeshift entitled CO2. I'm going to attach my bag, still holding in the tracheal tube, and I'm going to squeeze. Now, what I'm looking for is color change through my entitled CO2 detector. I can use a capnography device with this also and actually look for the number of the CO2 return as well as the waveform that I'm getting. I can tell the difference between a, a, an esophageal intubation and a, a tracheal intubation with the shape of the waveform that returns. And so uh, it's very valuable to utilize these. So you say, okay, we've got good CO2. So now it's time to what? Secure the endotracheal tube. Not yet. And here's why. We could be right main stemmed and we would still get CO2 return at our colorimetry device or our capnography device. So this just tells us that CO2 is being detected. It does not tell us if we are above the carina or past the carina in the right main stem. So at this point in time, I'm going to need to listen. Now, I likely need to be have help here because I can't squeeze this bag and hold this tube and listen to the patient all with just two hands. So at this point in time, I would like to give the bag to someone else as well as the tube. Someone else would take over this responsibility. Now for me, just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to let go of this tube just to show you what this looks like. I'm going to take my, my stethoscope and I'm going to put it on and I'm going to listen. So I'm going to listen here with a breath. I hear breath sounds. I hear breath sounds, breath sounds, breath sounds. I just, I just validated bilateral breath sounds. I'm going to listen over the epigastric or the, the stomach area and listen. And I do not hear any sounds happening in the stomach. So that tells me that we are in the airway. Bilateral breath sounds tells me that I'm not right main stem. If I heard breath sounds on the right, nothing on the left, and nothing over the stomach, then that would tell me all the air is going to the right side. I'm right main stemmed. So we want to be aware of that as well. Now, at this point in time, we are, uh, we feel good that we're in appropriate position. I'm going to note where this tube is located. This tube is located right now at the, uh, the 20 centimeter mark at the incisor. So we're going to mark this and secure this at the incisor. I don't have a securing device with me today. That'll be another video for another day. But this is where we are now in the process. But let's just stop right there for a second, because sometimes it doesn't go like this. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we end up in the esophagus. And the question is, is do you practice how that would look? So let's do that real quick. We're going to start over here. So we're going to remove this tube, let the cuff down, take this tube out. And we're just going to start over. Okay. So that's the way it's supposed to go, but sometimes it doesn't go like that. So let's take a look at how and what it should look like if we were to accidentally intubate into the esophagus instead of the trachea. Okay. So I've got my, my blade again. I'm going in to, to, I see my, I see my airway and I'm going to go in, but I don't really see it real clear, but I feel like I can probably find it. I feel like I can make it in there. And so I'm going to go for it. Terrible idea. That's never, you should never just, I'm just going to go for it. If you can't see the glottic opening, the likelihood of getting in there is not very high. So you always want to be able to visualize that first. I just, I just, let's just take a shot. Probably not going to work out in your favor. So I'm now in there. I took a shot at it. I think I'm there, but I'm not, I don't really know. I'm coming out. I'm securing my airway. I'm inflating my cuff. And I am now bagging. Okay. Now, let's just say that I use my entitled CO2 detector. And 
I check here and I do not get color change. Now, right there, I know I say, okay, well, if I'm not getting color change, then I'm likely in the esophagus. But let's say perhaps this happens in a facility that maybe you didn't have an entitled CO2. Okay, let's just create a crazy scenario here. So we're going to intubate now and we say, okay, well, let's validate now that we are in the airways. So I listen. I don't, I don't think I hear any breath sounds. No breath sounds. Nope. I don't hear any breath sounds. Epigastric. I hear air movement in the stomach. So what do we do now? We immediately deflate the cuff. Pull this tube out and we're going to bag this patient. So I'm going to get my mask because remember, we're not going to lose this, right? We don't want to lose our mask. So I've got my mask here and I am going to start the process of making sure that we are appropriately ventilating this patient. So we bag, bag, we're watching our, our, our monitors. We're seeing good chest rise. We're ventilating the patient. We're going to restore them back to baseline, make sure we oxygenate them well. And then we will come back and reattempt to get an endotracheal tube into the glottic opening. Now, once again, once you put that down into the esophagus, if you come out, you should probably consider using a new endotracheal tube because anything in the esophagus is now on this tube. And if you reinsert this tube into this patient's trachea, now the, all of that content is also in the trachea. So remember, keep this process clean and also practice failure. That's the key to being able to intubate a patient, being able to assist with intubation is to know the steps, know the, 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 the order of operation and know how to validate that you are in the airway or you are in the esophagus. You gotta be able to differentiate between those two. All right, and that's the intubation process. Do me a favor while you're here, hit the like, the subscribe, and leave me a comment for this video if you found any value into it. When you prepare for your competency, remember, an esophageal intubation is not failure. It's not knowing and how to detect an esophageal intubation that will harm a patient. Remember, average is easy, don't be it.